milestones. It is used sometimes in relation to surgery as a pre-surgical assessment tool or sometimes when there are inappropriate age demands and we need to delay surgery or in combination with surgery or post-surgical relapses. The basic premise which has been defined for botulinum toxin is dynamic spasticity. Dynamic spasticity, if uh, we look at what is dynamic spasticity, we commonly use the Tardieu scale where R1 is the fast catch component and R2 is the slow stretch and R2 minus R1 is the window of opportunity, so to say. The more this difference, the more is the dynamic spasticity and the better uh, chance of botulinum toxin acting. So if R2 is equal to R1 is equal to R2, that means a fixed contracture has set in. Whereas if this difference is Y, that means the spasticity is more dynamic. We are also using it to restore the agonist antagonist balance. And what we hope to achieve by reducing spasticity at an early age is increase the use of the muscle, increase the cortical representation, thereby developing neuroplasticity and a reinforcement of correct pattern. So uh, let me take you through some case scenarios. Now let's uh, look at this child here. If anyone would like to unmute and comment, they are more than welcome. What is happening over here as the child is walking? What can you see? What is the primarily problem which is happening in the left side? I'll go back. Yeah. To yes, if anybody would like to say anything or shall I go ahead? Can I comment now? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so he is walking with a hidden equinus. There must be a, uh, a contracture of TA uh, because he extending the knee to plantigrade his foot. Similarly, the, there is the retraction of upper limb, most probably going towards the hemiplegic gait. That's right. Yes. So we are looking at equinus. And with equinus, we know that uh, there is a very active, when the children land on the toe, there's a very, very active plantar flexion knee extension coupling, which happens because the ground reaction force is so ahead and that pushes the knee behind. So there's often a recurvatum knee. This is causing functional implications with the gait. Uh, this can cause problems even with using splints. And therefore here we are going to target the gastro. We are going to check even for the soleus um, by the silver school test. We need to look uh, for the hamstrings also because sometimes what happens is if the gastro is very, very active and uh, we only inject the gastro and we do not look at the hamstrings or we think that the hamstrings are not tight just because there was a recurvatum. So uh, the child can land into a uh, flex knee gait. So it's important to check for hamstrings also and also for the rectus here and then go ahead with the injection. So this is him after gastro injection, three years after. And a good uh, restored agonist antagonist balance here. This is him after eight years of intervention. Still a good heel contact. Okay, the other problem is the flex knee or the tight hamstrings. What that does is it can cause problems with this with sitting. The child will often slip down in the chair. In the gait, it causes a flex knee gait. If there is a conjunction, if there is a, a coexistent gastrosolus uh, spasticity, then it will look more like jump. But we, uh, we need to be very cautious about ruling out apparent equinus in such situations. Uh, so the functional implications with tight hamstrings is sacral sitting, uh, uh, high energy consumption and gait, torsional issues. So we target muscles like medial hamstrings. Um, if there is a jump component, gastro, look at the hip flexors also. Now, if uh, we mistake uh, apparent equinus to be a jump gate here and we inject the gastro 
our intervention is not going to succeed. If anybody would like to explain that, why that might be happening. Why is it important that we check gastro? Yeah, Gaurav, don't take it. Or Chinmay. So, so the question is, yeah. So if I'm getting it correctly, so the excessive weakening of the gastros will cause mm -hmm. the crouch gate progression? Absolutely. So uh, we have to really, really carefully assess and rule out apparent equinus from a jump gate through careful examination before any injections. And if there is a jump gate and we miss out on gastro, what is going to happen? And we just inject the hamstrings. The child is going to go into severe recovery and toe walking. So just an example of uh, a child walking with jump before the injection. She's on her toes. Uh, a lot of energy consumption is going on in the gait. And then a more stable gait. And here if we miss out on the rectus, what is going to happen? Would anybody like to comment? There will be a dragging of toe man. The knee yeah. In the swing of phase, she's going to have problems with clearing the knee. So there's a stiff knee if we don't address rectus and we miss out on that. Now, contraindications for botulinum would be uh, severe fixed deformity, weakness, or it's a myospasticity which is compatible with function. If there is generalized dystonia, we don't have very defined goals. A word of caution in those that have marked cognitive impairment and are likely to have poor compliance to therapy and splints or poor family support, neglect of the extremity and sensory impairment. Adverse reactions doc documented in literature mostly with high dosing with GMFCS 4 and 5 patients and concomitant comorbidities, respiratory uh, aspiration, infection, etc. Uh, even uh, mortality has been reported as a serious adverse event. Uh, a lot of uh, recent literature on muscle atrophy, but we need to think about if is it going to be any different from that resulting from plaster immobilization? Is it a disease atrophy or is it just the natural history of sarcopenia in children with cerebral palsy? We don't know and we need more research in terms of long-term effects and reversibility of muscle atrophy with botulinum toxin. So it would be a good idea to use botulinum after considerable thought, caution for injections in groups four and five, a lower dosing in a larger interval between injection, identifying the target muscles correctly and uh, managing the spasticity at that level. Thinking of balance between the joints is very, very important. And uh, plan strategically and use this uh, injection very wisely. Uh, that would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ratna, for this lovely talk. Uh, all the fellows can inquire question in chat box. My, uh, can you, uh, would you like to uh, brief them about what is the maximum dosage of botulinum we should use in a child? What is the upper limit? Yeah. So 16 to maximum 20 units per kg is what is written for botulinum. So this is 15 to 20 units per total body weight. So many a times younger kids who have uh, global spasticity, before we embark on injecting each muscle, we should calculate that that should not exceed more than 15 units per kilogram of body weight. Some children with GMFCS4 have respiratory issues and those are the Chinese uh, papers which have shown respiratory uh, arrest and aspirations after botulinum. So we should avoid that. And the recent guideline from Melbourne says that we should not inject twice in a year. So we should span more than a year. 
and the dosage should be not in excess of 15 units per total uh, body weight, 15 units per kilogram total, total body weight. So that's an important uh, one. Uh, comment, you know, I have done uh, SUAS injection through posterior approach. And uh, our anesthetists are very uh, skillful in giving this SUAS block. Uh, my anesthetist uh, carries an ultrasound machine for his regional blocks. And so it is very easy to inject from posterior approach. You can nicely see the, all the, uh, the fibers of SUAS and they can guide you where is the lumbar plexus. So you remain a little bit away from it so that you can try. Although there is a recent paper that whether we should relax Iliosuas, either by Botox or surgery, because that has effect on the uh, step length or the initiation of uh, deflection. So, so I have used it in few, but I have not uh, stopped. Amitosh uh, is asking, what is the preferred age range for Botox injection? As young as uh, two, two and a half, provided you have clear uh, indication for doing that. Up till the age of five, six, or even later in conjunction with uh, uh, what tool of management you're using. Yeah, so Amitosh, I would uh, add to that that we have used it in children younger than two years also, uh, not to gain the walking ability, but some children, as Ratna said, they used to slide in the chair there is significant hamstring and adductor tightness, uh, which led to sitting imbalance. So in those cases, when they, had, they did not have adequate proximal truncal strength, we have injected at the age of two years to improve their sitting balance. So for cerebral palsy, youngest, youngest child is, we have used in about two years. And uh, we also used it in pre-adolescent age groups, because uh, considering surgery at that age means that they would need a second set of surgery. So those borderline patients I have used in sort of 11 year, 12 year old boy or say 10 years old girl to buy time. And uh, it, during that time, we accentuate therapy, orthotic management, give Botox, buy time and consider definite surgery near skeletal maturity. So those are the two extremes. And Sheenam would tell you how we how we are using it in infants, you know, for uh, brachial plexus palsy. Yes, Chinmay. Uh, Ma'am, do you have any specific indication in GMFCS four and five? Those who are having the tight adduction, uh, wind windship like deformity of the hip, they are having a, uh, um, I mean, difficulty in clearing the hygiene, uh, cleaning, and everything. So for GMFCS uh, 4 and 5, it's more uh, about uh, sitting balance. As far as uh, hip displacement goes, uh, there is enough evidence to say that botulinum is not going to prevent hip displacement. Uh, injection to adductor is not going to help with hip displacement. But uh, hygiene care, it is definitely an indication and improving sitting balance. Sometimes... Uh, the GMFC is four. We can actually improve the because there's a lot of uh, activity with hip flexor, adductor, hamstring. So sometimes stance, standing, just to help them stand better with support in a GMFC is four can be an indication. Just walking, uh, not walking, just standing with a uh, standing support, just to help them stand with the standing support can be an indication. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, Gaurav. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to know: Have you came across any case with very high-grade fever post Botox injection? No, not yet. Have you oh, had? I, a yeah. So I injected Botox in a three-year-old, probably two and a half-year-old child, and post injection he had got one zero two, one zero three. It took one day to settle. Obviously, he settled with antipyretics, but this happened. I, I don't know, was it a hypersensitivity? Like but never like 102. Sir, have you not ever? No fever, but uh, 
yes pain at the injection site and uh, these are uh, even fever has been uh, reported you know the rare uh, side effects of botox fever they have reported but it subsides in a day pain and respiratory symptoms so these are the rare occurrence now we have to titrate whether it is secondary to injection or something else is going on but in uh, this practice that has never been a big problem so i mean i'm never explaining family that patient kind have fever you know after like in vaccines always pediatricians tells us i mean they tell us that fever ho sakta hai it's not common i think chinmay has a question and this is chinmay already asked sir that question okay. ma'am i have one more question yeah so i had a patient who said that she was given boto uh, she she had got some genetic study which told that she is uh, i mean allergic to type a so have you came across any case where you have to use something else apart from uh, type a uh, toxin no i have never used anything apart from type a and uh, where i work that is uh, dr johari has over 3000 uh, case experiences and still never uh, used anything beyond type a but uh, this is actually the first time i am listening to uh, this genetic test which says that is that correct the, the, yeah they 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 came from us they shifted from us and they said that we have got this genetic testing done okay. uh, because they were injected with botox and they had some issues with it i don't know exactly but then they said so we got this genetic testing which told that this will not work in this child and if we have to use anything it should be maybe type b or something okay antibody testing it must be right presence of antibody The, yes, ma'am. I didn't got you. Personally, I don't have experience of using type. So, for a few, uh, few of our colleagues, especially like uh, Benjamin Joseph sir, they they have a huge series of using phenol. But the problem with phenol is, if you are not cautious enough, you know, it may produce permanent chemo denervation. So before the uh before the arrival of botox phenol was used uh, but it's i have never used it in my practice right okay. and uh so yeah there are uh, one must remember that um, although uh, ratna mentioned but i would like to bring it to notice to everyone that we should span it very judiciously because what happens just like other medications botox can also uh, develop resistance and we have seen that the response to the first time injection is quite good and as the number of injection uh, increases you would see the the spasticity uh, relief also gradually reduces and families can tell you very readily, readily that uh, sir last time jo first time jo effect mila tha itna lamba nahi mila hai and those all i'm talking about dynamic spasticity patients not that uh, those who have developed static uh, elements also so so we have to span it uh, across the globe it is also used for pain relief but uh, in india uh, or the patients who have we have to work on better pain relief uh, medications and we should reserve botox for uh, relaxation rather than pain relief purpose you know? so uh, i besides cerebral palsy uh, and brachial plexus ratna have you used it for uh, torticollis or paraspinal injections any time no no sir not for torticollis or paraspinal so if uh, any question or we can switch to next talk So thanks, Ratna. That was a nice and comprehensive talk about botulinum use. So, uh, Sheena, are you ready for your presentation? You can share your screen. Yes, Thank mm-hmm. you.
you can go to slide show and uh, start from here beginning uh hello everyone uh so my topic is a uh, use of botulinum toxin injection for shoulder imbalance in infancy for brachial plexus birth palsy firstly we know patients with evolving neurological recovery uh, ends up in shoulder imbalance cause uh, internal rotators are more uh, rec recruited than the external rotators so they develop internal rotation contracture shoulder uh, imbalance develops early in infancy uh, that's a uh, cause of internal rotation contracture there is loss of passive external rotation range we can see in the picture uh, there is loss of passive external rotation natural recovery can take place till 1.0 uh, till 1 and 1/2 years of age it is difficult to know quantitatively the amount of regeneration even with electromyography in the presence of contracture it it will be difficult uh, to develop strength in the external rotators botulinum toxin injection in shoulder internal rotators will uh, re reduce the internal rotation contracture and so improve the external rotation range our purpose of study was uh, to uh, bring out the efficacy of botulinum toxin injection to improve muscle imbalance across the shoulder can it change the natural history of the condition as we know uh, in the normal uh, in the people uh, born with obstetric birth brachial plexus palsy there there are in the 95% uh, population they get uh, relieved with the uh, tendon transfer is required 132 infants were followed at comprehensive brachial plexus clinic between 2011 and 13 22 infants with progressive internal rotation contracture uh, were given botulinum toxin injection average age was uh, 10 and 1/2 months no prior nerve surgery was done in these cases infants with passive external rotation less than 40 were selected for the procedure we gave injection in subscapularis and pectoralis major muscles a uh, 3 units per kg body weight injection was given and no repeat procedure was done average follow up was 1.5 years uh, that uh, this is the technique described in this uh, video that's uh, how we gave injection firstly arm arm is held in the position of internal rotation and forward flexion as shown then uh, we made the medial border prominent and we bent the needles a uh, 45 degree angle and then uh, insert it in the subscapularis muscle and then we check uh, whether uh, they are in the uh, subscapularis muscle or not then we inject the botulinum toxin here in this video our uh, injection uh, in the pectoralis major muscle has been described firstly we have marked the border of uh, clavicle and then uh, pectoralis major now we have uh, inserted needles in pectoralis major muscle that's how we uh, check they are in muscle or not so shinam can i interrupt for a moment 
So while you inject into subscapular areas, uh, you bend the needle and touch to the under surface of scapula. The muscle which uh, lies just uh, below it is subscapularis. So you touch, just we do in hip arthrogram, when we put a needle, we touch to the neck of femur and then withdraw it gently. Similarly, while you inject, you withdraw it gently and inject uh, at four points. And in fact, major, you know, the nipple line is drawn because the clavicular head of pack, the proximal row is for the clavicular head of pack major and the distal row is for the sternal head. And if you know the anatomy uh, of the, the nerves, pectoral nerves, they, there are two neurovascular pedicles for uh, clavicle as well as uh, sternal head. One lies lateral to the, mid, uh, the nipple line and one lies medial. So you should span your needles like this to have optimum effect of Botox. Yeah, Srinam, you can go ahead. After injecting, manual stretching is done. So what were the outcome measures uh, of our study? Uh, we, uh, we considered active moment scale, passive and active shoulder moments, degree of trumpeting, and posterior subluxation. In the control group, 20 patients were included with similar clinical findings in infancy. They didn't receive a Botox injection and were only observed. In the group, we, uh, we have patients uh, who were injected with Botox injection and in the group B, no Botox injection was given. Active passive uh, external rotation was comparable. Degree of trumpeting is comparable. AMS score is also comparable in the pre-injection group. Axial imaging has been shown here. Uh, this uh, here we can see waters type, uh, waters classification. Now, uh, what were the results in the uh, injection group? That is group A, passive external rotation increased to 54 degree. That is of significant P value. Mean trump trumpeting also decreased to 46 degrees. And AMS score uh, increased to 98. External rotation also increased to 4.4. All values were of significant having significant value. This is an example of a patient who was injected with a Botox. This is a pre-injection video. We can see external rotation. Here, external rotation is around minus 10. And uh, we can see post-injection video. That is six months post-Botox injection. And in the six months, we can see there is much increase in external rotation. This is an example of other patient that is of eight months of uh, female child. With recent reduction in passive external rotation range from 60 to 20 degree with the development of internal rotation contracture. The HSCMS score was uh, 83. There was deep anterior crease, short arm segment. We can see external rotation, uh, external rotation is much decreased.
uh, this is a pre injection and post injection external rotation we can see post injection external rotation increased to around 80 to 90 degrees we also check a uh, reduction of the glenohumeral joint on the usg and post injection spica was given in external rotation and abduction and we can see the results results 10 months post injection abduction has been increased to around 160 degree it was a pre injection 90 degrees although trumpeting has been uh, has not been much decreased we can see uh, the subsequent shoulder surgery is needed in the control group and uh, there are many uh, there are less patients who needed subsequent surgery in the group a the patients who were injected with botulinum toxin there are only 11 patients uh, who were who needed surgery and in the control group there were 19 patients that is 95% there were four patients uh, who needed a uh, there was a uh, less magnitude of surgery was needed so total totally uh, they make a uh, 15 patients who needed less magnitude of surgery so we can uh, reduce uh, either we surgery can be avoided or quantum of surgery can be reduced if we talk about waters classification uh, in the group a that were that were the patients who were injected with botox has a uh, botox type 2 classification uh, on mri and uh, in the control group they were of type 3 or 4 maybe due to a more uh, external internal rotation contracture they also develop subsequent glenohumeral uh, bony deformity so we can see 73% patients were of type 2 in group a and 80% patients were of type 3 or 4 in in control group so we can see botulinum toxin injection can reduce uh, can uh, alter the natural history of disease that is uh, it can change the waters uh, classification 73% patients of injection group have have water type 2 schema and 80% control group has a uh, water 3 or 4 mri morphology cause internal rotation contracture uh, has led to uh, this um, grade of water classification it prevents glenohumeral morphology technique of injection uh, was we injected the in, uh, we injected botulinum toxin from the uh, medial border as we can see there is, there are three compartments that is superficial middle and inferior we can see major chunk of the muscle is, is on the medial side that is medial compartment most volume uh, is made from a uh, medial side result of botox injection were there were 61 patients 45 patients uh, in the 40 in the from the 40 out of 45 patients 18 patients uh, so uh, shinam <coughs> so if we can go can you go a slide back so, so it's very important slide so now uh, before injecting this uh, 
subscapularis, we also should be aware of this neuronal compartment or partitioning as Ratna mentioned in her talk. So uh, there is superior and middle and inferior segments. Now conventionally the Botox has been done from the lateral border with EMG, but there is a high likelihood that you may miss the superior uh, uh, partition where the C56 uh, recruited muscles are there. And subscapularis, if you just keep on inject from the lateral side, you may miss this. So, so we have been using this medial approach and, and we have seen nice relaxation in all these patients. Now, this paper was, uh, I read in POSI way back in 2013 or 14, but we followed all these patients. And by now we have done a Botox in almost 90 patients with subscap. Yeah, Shinam, can you go ahead and next slide? And this was an intermediate follow-up group with 61 patients who were uh, injected between 2013 and 19. And out of four, those 45 patients were available for follow-up, we found that 40% of this patient did not require further surgery because they improved in their, uh, uh, their elevation and global external rotation in grade of four or five. So parents declined, they did not want surgery. Some of these patients still have uh, a habitual trumpeting and with exercises and with uh, rehab, their trumpeting is gradually reducing, but they are not functionally limited and family, uh, they, does, they did not want further intervention. Now, 60% patients, those who required shoulder rebalancing subsequently, we found that 90% of them have primary pre-injection passive external rotation less than 10 degrees. This means that more severe internal rotation contracture that might be less, rec less recruitment into external rotators. And those patients, we use this injection to buy time because performing a tendon transfer surgery before 18 months, uh, we have found issues of cooperation from parents, uh, from patients. So they don't cooperate for rehab and uh, uh, sometimes the outcome is compromised. So I tend to delay tendon transfer surgery till one and a half, two years. So these patients with passive external rotation less than 10 degrees, we use botulinum for buying time. And what was noteworthy is that this, if we inject and if we prevent internal rotation contracture to progress, the glenohumeral deformity halts at either waters one or two. You no, know? otherwise those patients end up into three or three and four, and sometimes shoulder rebalancing surgery cannot produce enough remodeling. Yeah, go ahead, Shinam. So, like uh, we define in infants with internal rotation contracture based on the degrees of passive external rotation. When passive external rotation between 60 and 40, I term it as a beginning of internal rotation contracture where you have to intensify therapy, talk with your physiotherapist, night splint should be advocated. When passive external rotation is between 40 degrees and 10, we term it as an established contracture. You have to very aggressively treat it and uh, you can give Botox in subscap and pack major. Now, two things I observed when uh, the uh, glenohumeral joint relocates. Earlier on, I used to give aeroplane splint, but I found uh, that family might remove the splints earlier on because of stretch pain, and then patient would become non-compliant. So now I give shoulder spica in all of them and see very good relaxation. That's one. The second thing is we have seen some children who have tight but weak subscapularis. Those children who cannot reach the midline or those who cannot reach their back pocket, those uh, children have a weak subscap and there I avoid injecting into subscap and we just give shoulder spike up. You understand that the, giving, the reason of giving Botox here is to prevent the co-contract. The most common co-contraction is shoulder internal rotators and external rotators. And second is as per Dr. Chuang, is in between pec major and deltoid. So, so to relieve those co-contraction, we give this. And finally, those who are less than 10 degrees, we term it as a neglected contracture. 
so there i use botox for very young children but there are people across the globe they have been doing uh, tendon transfer as early as 9 months the problem with that is in 9 months the transferred tendon would also not have recruited well so we we doubt the outcome of those patients so we try to buy time by giving botox and in those cohort we have to do a shoulder spike right so that is in nutshell uh, how we use botox in uh, brachial plexus pulse so any comments or question i will be will be happy to answer this so is a and for uh, all children right with botox at sorry casting is done for all children with botox at the center uh yes most i earlier on my practice was that if there is no jumping in of shoulder then i would give aeroplane splint but uh, we realized it that some children they don't jump in then they remain into shudo glenoid you know even in the infancy and as they grow what they end up is what the posteriorly aligned glenoid now this phenomenon is also observed by peter waters and group so early on practice was if there is jumping in then you give spica and stretch the capsule but now i gave shoulder spica in all the patients where i inject with subscap and pack major because you want the arm to remain uh, persistently in external rotation in order to stretch anterior capsule and ligaments what happened in few patients and few families said that after stretching and botox for first few weeks where botox action starts in the child is painful and then they don't wear the splint and by the time muscle gets relaxed they they have an apathy of or a fear of wearing aeroplane splint so i use shoulder spica for 3 weeks in most of our children we we have not controlled and studied it but uh, uh, through the response of families and my experience i found that it is more it gives more persistent and long lasting relaxation of internal rotators thank you yeah one more question what is the age limit for botox in brachial plexus so vigneshwaran uh, we know that uh, uh we need to give botox the no natural recovery can happen till one and a half years and after that we cannot expect further recovery i give botulinum usually in infancy but there are instances where the children have good degrees of elevation but they have significant trumpeting and internal rotation contracture so their c56 recruitment has happened but due to early recruitment of uh, uh, internal rotators the external rotators are not able to execute movement so those older children also i have injected into subscap and pack major thinking that their recruitment is already there so let me just relax uh, temporarily the internal rotators and and accentuate their external rotators and we have found success in few so the old the oldest child in our series is 2 and 1/2 years so that baby had around 120 degree of elevation but significant trumpeting and passive external rotation so i discussed with the family that uh, as the other muscles supplied by c fix c56 are recruited i assume that your external rotators are, are also recruited but due to overpowering of internal rotator they are not able to execute the movement so let let me try botox and casting if that exercise fails we'll go for tendon transfer and then there are some families they don't want two intervention they say you do whatever you want to do but just one intervention in those cases i don't uh, i go for tendon transfer right away so the upper age the youngest child i have done botulinum is 4 months and the oldest is 2 and 1/2 years so yeah we we have done a few less than 6 months where there is significant contracture and infantile dislocation
right so if uh, we have we have no further question i'll uh, conclude this session today we are right dot in time uh, thank you very much ratna for your valuable time and a very nice talk thanks sheena for lovely presentation and let me first stop recording and then we can thank you ma'am thank you the mm. report okay so yeah i have stopped recording right so uh, thank you very much should i end meeting or uh, we can interact for few minutes ko phone karu chu ek minute ka phone karu right so this this was uh, that if you can share that pd of uh, pdf of surface anatomy in botulina i can share in the fellows group we have a fellows group and they can have ready uh, reference what i know that uh, there are more myomural junction near the nerve entry so we have been doing more proximal and uh, injections where there are more but this uh, pdf would be of great use great help okay thanks ratna thank you everyone so we'll see you next week uh, with uh, uh, other we have the faculty from admont and dr uh, sukhdeep dulai coming and she is expert in foot reconstruction in cp so probably that is next time or or, or thereafter we'll see okay see you. thank you sir thanks chin mai take care thank you thanks gaurav bye thank you sir bye Thank <laughs> you.